Hey everybody and welcome to XSTEM All Access. My name is Justin Schaefer, also known as Mr. Fascinate, and I'm excited to be back as your host for this multi-day series filled with STEM inspiration. Today is the fourth and final day of this exciting XSTEM series with episodes brought to you by the USA Science and Engineering Festival. The mission of the USA Science and Engineering Festival is to inspire the next generation to pursue careers in STEM. You can check out their other free programs and events for teachers and students at usasciencefestival.org. Before we begin, please join me in thanking our partners, AstraZeneca, the U.S. Air Force, and the U.S. Department of Defense, DOD STEM, for making this XSTEM series possible. I hope you're ready to be inspired and have some fun with me and another amazing group of STEM role models. Over the last few days, we've heard from engineers, aviators, and neuroscientists. Today, we're gonna take a deep dive into the sea. We'll get out of our seats and dance to some STEM tunes, and we'll be answering your previously submitted questions during the program. But don't worry, if you have more questions during the program, send them to us using the form at usasciencefestival.org, and we'll get those answers to you after the program. I hope you're as excited as I am to get started. Before we jump in, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So my name again is Justin Schaefer, but I also go by Mr. Fascinate, Pre-COVID, I traveled all over the world exciting young people about STEM using projects such as my cartoon series, Hood Science, the Magic Cool Bus, the STEM Success Summit, and a STEM education app I'm working on right now to excite you all about STEM careers. So feel free to follow me there and learn more about some of that work. And I'm coming to you all from New York City, but you all are representing the entire globe. We have attendees from Maine, Colorado, Georgia, Kentucky, Delaware, Massachusetts, Utah, and Virginia, just to name a few. And international attendees from Jamaica, Saudi Arabia, Japan, Botswana, Ecuador, the Philippines, Venezuela, Turkey, Egypt, and much, much more. Welcome to everybody. Wherever you're joining us from today, make sure you also show us how you stem on social media. Tag us at USA Science Fest and me at Mr. Fascinate and use the hashtag show us how you STEM. You can share your science projects, show how you explore nature, or how you're acting as a STEM ambassador in your community. Grab your phone and take a selfie while tuning in today. Speaking of selfies, there'll be an opportunity for a virtual selfie with me during today's program. So make sure you have your camera on standby. Don't forget to share and tag us to show us how you STEM. Now, let's get started with today's program. Our theme today is deep sea science. As a marine and environmental science major myself, I couldn't be more excited to hear from today's guests whose work takes us into the deep blue to study diverse marine life. And I'm not talking about just any marine life. Who else out there is fascinated by sharks and other large marine creatures? I know some of you all are, I definitely am. First, we'll hear from marine biologist, Dr. Mike Heithouse. Later in the program, we'll hear from explorer and shark tracking expedition leader, Chris Fisher. And in between, we'll rock out to some deep sea science tunes from our friend, Roy Moy III from STEM Music. Now, let's get started. I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Mike Heithouse. Mike is a marine biologist who specializes in predator-prey interactions and the ecological importance of sharks and other large marine species, such as dolphins and sea turtles. Mike also serves as the Dean of College of Arts, Sciences and Education and Professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Florida International University. You may have seen Mike on TV during one of Discovery Channel's Shark Weeks or on the National Geographic Channel. Dr. Mike Heithouse, welcome to our program. It is awesome to be here. Awesome. Well, Mike, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Well, thanks. It's uh, always great to be able to share my passion for the oceans, sharks, and some of the other amazing creatures that are there. And uh, just want to thank everybody for spending some time with us today. Um, I am a marine biologist, and uh, there is no question that I have the best job in the world. And it's a great job because I get to travel all over the world to work with amazing animals, see just incredible people that do amazing work and also to really be able to make a difference uh, for animals, for oceans and for the people that rely on the oceans. And, you know, even though I get to travel all over the world, 
I didn't start out as a world traveler. I started out growing up in the forests and fields of central Ohio. Um, and I took every opportunity I could to be outside. That is me doing silly things, trying to build my own pond because I loved fish and wanted to have some in the backyard. Um, I also took every opportunity I could to uh, interact with animals. And uh, you might guess how this turned out. Not, not so great. Uh, it ended up with mom with the hose rinsing me down before I was allowed to go back in the house. But, you know, all of that exploration in my own backyard, you know, led me on to great things. And when I was a kid, one of the animals that really fascinated me was dolphins. I saw them on TV. When I made trips to the beach, I, I got to see them in the wild. And I always wanted to know more about them. And I remember as a kid watching a TV show and seeing a scientist named Richard Connor studying these amazing dolphins in Australia. And I thought to myself, you know, that is amazing, but it's not a kid, something that a kid from Ohio ever gets to do. And then one year I was at a big gathering where scientists share all their information and I ran into Richard and I went up and introduced myself. And six months later, I found myself on an airplane flying from Ohio to Western Australia to a place called Shark Bay to help Richard out with his research. And it was just amazing to be able to do that and to spend hours every day with dolphins. And I got to learn so much, but studying dolphins led me to uh, one of the other creatures that I am super passionate about now, and that is sharks. And I started getting interested in sharks because when we were looking at these dolphins, we found out that, you know, they weren't spending a lot of time where there was lots of fish to eat. And I wonder, well, why wouldn't they go to the buffet table? And when we started looking, what we saw was that a lot of these dolphins had scars on their bodies where they'd been bitten by tiger sharks. And when I tried to find out what we knew about tiger sharks, it turned out we knew almost nothing about them even though these are big sharks that live in areas where uh, there are lots of people. And it turns out that tiger sharks are perfectly adapted for eating bigger animals like dolphins. First, they get huge. They can be up to 15 to 18 feet long, and they have this giant head that's really wide right at the end of their snout. So they can actually grab on to animals like turtles or sea cows, and shake their heads back and forth. And with those teeth that are curved and serrated, they can cut right through even a turtle shell. Now, if you're a tiger shark and you've eaten a turtle, you have a problem. Even though you've got all that yummy turtle inside you, you also have shell. But don't worry, tiger sharks have it completely sorted out. Once they've digested the good parts, they can turn their stomach inside out through their mouth. The shell falls out, then they go suck their stomach back down, and they're ready to go again. And they can look for others of their favorite foods, like you know, their version of spaghetti, sea snakes. They'll eat sea snakes all day if they can get them. But um, how do we learn more about tiger sharks? Well, the first thing you have to do is to catch the tiger sharks. So what we do is we go out before the sun rises and we set lines out, baited with just a little bit of fish. And then we go out in our pretty small boats and catch very big tiger sharks. And it turns out if you actually drive slowly and let those sharks swim alongside your boat, they're actually really calm. And so it makes it fairly easy to work with them. We can measure how long they are. Uh, we can collect little samples of their blood so we can see what they've been eating um, and how healthy they are. And then we can attach tags to their dorsal fin. And those tags let us know which animal it is. So if we catch them again, we can see how big they grew. Or if someone else catches them, we can see how far they moved. We can also attach cool instruments to these sharks, like cameras. And this is one of the first sharks we ever put a camera on about 20 years ago. And this is National Geographic's Critter Cam. And it lets us go where the animals go and see what they see from their perspective. And if you think I'm going to show you an amazing video of a tiger shark swimming around with a camera on it, I'm not. Because tiger sharks are kind of boring. They spend almost all day just swimming, swimming, swimming. They're not these mindless killing machines that people think of. In fact, they actually spend most of their time just swimming around looking for potential food that doesn't see them because, yeah, they're kind of lazy as predators. 
Um, now, what are they eating in Shark Bay? They're eating animals like dugongs. This is Australia's version of a manatee. And they're also eating sea turtles like this green sea turtle. And to learn about sharks and how important they are for the ecosystem, it turns out we have to spend a lot of time studying their prey. And uh, for the turtles, uh, the way you catch a turtle is you just jump off your perfectly good boat, hold on, and hope you keep your uh, hands on the turtle. This is actually a loggerhead turtle. They have a much bigger head than the green turtles because they eat uh, clams and hard things. Once we have the turtles, we can actually put uh, different devices on them. This is the world's first 360 VR camera going on a green turtle. So pretty soon we're going to be able to let you go online and it'll be like you're swimming on the back of a turtle. You'll be able to look around and see what it sees. And when we have these cameras on animals like turtles, we see amazing things. We see how they interact with other turtles. We see what they eat. And we've even seen the turtle version of Knuckles. Turtles don't have Knuckles. So when they greet each other, they can just do this headbutt and just keep swimming. Uh, that's turtles. Whenever you put cameras on animals, you never know what you're going to see. But this is just a glimpse of some of the work we've done in this in Shark Bay. The important thing I want you guys to know is that sharks are really important to ecosystems. What we found is that these tiger sharks are important for maintaining the balance of Shark Bay. If we didn't have the tiger sharks there, we wouldn't have as much seagrass. If we didn't have as much seagrass, we wouldn't have all the little fish that grow up to be the big fish that people like to catch. Um, we wouldn't have the food there for the dugongs and turtles in the same way. And we really need to worry about this because sharks are in trouble. In fact, in some places, their populations are down by 90%. So instead of just protecting sharks, we need to think about how we actually bring more sharks back into our ocean. And those are some of the other projects that we're working on around the world. Uh, this is a a bit of us working on hammerhead sharks. We did this for a film for TV, um, but we need to know, know more about hammerhead sharks, but hammerhead sharks are really fragile. So you don't wanna catch them on lines. So if you're gonna put a camera on, the easiest thing to do is uh, get them interested in some bait, swim down and yeah, just put the camera on by hand. Believe me, it's a lot harder than it looks. But when you finally get it on, it is spectacular and we can get this view into the hammerhead sharks world. But putting cameras on animals isn't the only way we're studying these sharks. We're also going around the world with lots of scientists. In fact, we're working with more than 100 scientists around the world to put cameras on coral reefs to see where the sharks are doing well and where they're in trouble. And this is a place where sharks are doing great. This is what coral reefs should look like. But unfortunately, at about one out of every five reefs we went to, we didn't see any sharks at all. And so with this project that we call Global Fin Print, we're now trying to work with fishermen, with governments and other people to figure out how we can bring sharks back in the areas where they're in trouble and how we can protect sharks when they're in good shape like this. Now, there are a few last things I want you guys to think about. The first is that doing science is awesome, but sharing it is even more fun. That's why I love working and doing the TV shows and doing projects that bring science into your classrooms. So go out and do science and then share it with your friends, your families, and everybody. The last thing I wanna let you know is that you can be a scientist too right now. You don't need to be a doctor or anything to be a scientist because scientist is about exploring your world. It's about asking questions and then trying to answer those questions for yourself and do it as a team. There are so many amazing things out there in science, technology, engineering, and math. And I hope that you all will get as excited about it as I am. And uh, now I can't wait to answer your questions. Mike, that was absolutely fantastic. Wow, you just blew my mind with some really cool facts there. I actually studied marine science in undergrad and I didn't know that sharks could barf up their own stomachs. That's so cool how you shared that with us, your research on dolphins hooking cameras up on different animals and seeing how they explore the wilderness and also, of course, preserving our ecosystems. I think that was a fantastic presentation for everyone that li that's listening. Let's jump right on into the Q&A here. Looks like some audience members sent in their questions before the show, and we have a few students who will be asking their questions in person. So here's our first question from Logan in Springfield, Virginia. Logan asks, 
does coral have any predators and how does it die? Yeah, coral does have predators and uh, some of the biggest are parrotfish. And so parrotfish have those beaks and they can go and crunch at the coral reef. They eat the, uh, the coral little bodies called polyps. Um, but you know, tiger sharks can barf up turtle shells. Parrotfish, they actually swallow a lot of that coral rock. They digest it and they poop it out as sand. So when you're walking on the beach, you may be walking on parrotfish poop. Um, but you know, those corals also, um, are not just, not every little polyp is its own animal. They actually grow as big colonies. So the colony doesn't die when they're eaten by those parrotfish, but still corals are in trouble. Uh, they're diseases and pollution that are killing whole colonies and whole reefs. So that's one of the reasons we got to make sure that we're really careful with, uh, not putting things in the ocean or even down the drains that we shouldn't because, uh, we need to make sure the water quality is really good for those corals. Yeah, it's really interesting insight there on corals. I know they're also some of the oldest organisms on our planet as well. Looks like we have another question from one of our viewers, Sophia. And the video is coming right up for that one. Hi, Dr. Mike. Since you are a marine biologist, I was just wondering, what's your favorite marine animal? Oh, Sophia, you just asked me the hardest question to answer. It's usually whatever cool animal I'm working with uh, the next time or, or I have been. But look, I love those tiger sharks. They are just amazing animals. They're super adaptable. The hammerhead sharks are great. But, uh, you know, I still I love whales, dolphins. I, that is one question I just can't answer. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, when you got so many options to choose from. I don't even know what my favorite one is either. <laughs> Looks like we have another question coming in from Karis, who's joining us all the way from Hawaii. And the video is about to roll in a second here. Hi, my name is Karis and I live in Oahu. I have been taught that many animals have specific attributes that help them thrive or survive in their environment. My question is, does the shape of the bottlenose dolphin's nose serve a specific purpose? Um, that is a great question, and it turns out that those skulls of dolphins are really perfectly adapted to their lifestyle. Having that beak helps them catch fish, and the way that the skull is built, it has a something called a melon that sits there, and that's what they use to help focus the sound that comes out from their uh, a structure called the monkey lips that clicks really fast. That sound goes out through the melon, hits fish or other objects, and then bounces back. And they can use that sound to make an image to help them find their prey, even if it's pitch black or the water's really murky. And then having that beak helps them catch those slippery, fast fish. Hmm, that's really interesting. Man, it's crazy how all these marine mammals and pretty much every organism in the ocean has some physiological adaptations to help them navigate and survive and thrive in their environments. Looks like we have another question here from an eighth grader in San Francisco. They ask, what can I do to help creatures in the ocean that are at risk? You know, that that's another one of my favorite questions. And there's a lot we can do to help ocean creatures that are at risk. One thing is that when we eat seafood, you should use the seafood guides that are out there. So you're choosing fish that are fished sustainably. We also need to make sure we're really careful with the amount of waste we produce. Uh, we don't want to let plastics get into the oceans because they can cause real trouble for marine mammals, for fish, and all kinds of other organisms. So make sure you recycle what can be recycled and dispose of your waste properly. And when you are eating seafood, make sure it's sustainable. Mm, those are awesome answers, Mike. Thank you for that perspective. And we also know the ocean is a carbon sink. So the more carbon dioxide you're putting out into the atmosphere, the more ends up being absorbed by our oceans. So thanks for that question. Looks like we have one more question coming in from James and the video is rolling right now. Hi, Dr. Eichhaus, I'm James from Washington, DC. Can you tell us what it's like to study creatures underwater? Uh, hi, James. Boy, you guys all have great questions. And you know, it is awe-inspiring to study creatures underwater. You know, to put on scuba tanks and be in their environment um, is really exhilarating. And it really gives you a great appreciation for them. Um, and then some of the work we do on boats being up close to whales while we're trying to put cameras on their backs with suction cups, it's just awe-inspiring. 
it is a real privilege. And that's one of the reasons I like sharing what I do so much. It's not just the science we learn, but sharing it with the world, because ultimately we want the work we do to help protect these animals and ensure that the oceans are in even better shape uh, for the next generation than they are right now. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that perspective, Mike. I remember one of my research internships actually got to go 40 nautical miles off the coast of the open ocean. And I got to see the night sky with no light pollution. It was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. All kinds of STEM adventures like that are definitely possible in the marine science world. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions for Mike. But if you have another question for Mike that we didn't cover today, then ask us right now. Go to the form at usasciencefestival.org and we'll get Mike's answers to you after the program. So let's not say goodbye to Mike just yet. Mike, are you up for a really quick virtual selfie with our audience? Absolutely. All right. Sounds good. So everybody grab your smartphones. I'll give you a couple seconds here. And Mike, what we're going to do is we're going to take one cool smiling one and then we're going to take one really silly one. All right. Ready to go. Okay. All right. So I think everyone should have their phones by now. So let's do a, a thumbs up smile on this first one. All right. Three, two, one. All right, cool. Okay, so the next one I want to do is a really goofy one. So I don't know, maybe like you just got to, maybe you just came face to face with a tiger shark in the ocean, Mike. What is the face that you'd make if that happened? All right, and I'll make the face I'd make, okay? <laughs> All right. All right, on the count of three, let's go. One, two, three. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. So thank you all for taking those pictures with us. Hope you enjoyed that, Mike. Don't forget to share those selfies with us. Be sure to tag at USA Science Fest and me at Mr. Fascinate and use the hashtag show us how you STEM. Everybody, please give Mike a virtual high five and a round of applause. Mike, it was an absolute pleasure meeting you, learning about your work and learning about all the cool stuff you're doing in our oceans. Uh, thanks so much, Justin. And uh, hopefully we'll get you out on the boat with us really soon. <laughs> that would be awesome, man. I'm looking forward to it if it happens. Before we dive into our next speaker session, let's take a few minutes for a brain break. I'm excited to introduce the incredibly talented Roy Moy III from The STEM Music. Roy is an aerospace engineer who combines his love of music with his passion for STEM to inspire the next generation of multicultural STEM professions. Let's get up and get ready to move this incredible jam. Deep sea diving. We call it STEM music. The marine life we will see all night. Deep sea dive, deep sea dive, deep sea dive. Deep sea dive, deep sea dive. Gonna take a look at the marine life. Deep sea dive, deep sea dive. See how many animals we can find on a deep sea dive. A deep sea dive. Gonna see them all and it's gonna be nice on a deep sea dive. A deep sea dive, gonna take a look at the marine life. What's that I see? I see a sea turtle laying eggs on a beach, beach and I see him diving in the sea, sea, holding his breath for hours indeed. Now take a look at the jellyfish, jellyfish that doesn't have a brain. Super long tentacles like the ones on the jelly called the lion's mane. Check out the stingray under the sea waves. Got a tail full of venom. Eyes on the top side, so for food, they use electrical sensors in them. We're going on a deep sea dive, deep sea dive. Gonna take a look at the marine life. Deep sea dive, deep sea dive. See how many animals we can find on a deep sea dive. A deep sea dive. Gonna see them all, and it's gonna be nice on a deep sea dive. A deep sea dive. Gonna take a look at the marine life. Tiburon, tiburon, tiburon. Shark, 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 yeah, they got it going on. From the black tip reef shark swimming near the surface to the nurse shark with the bottom dweller purpose. No bones found, only cartilage. Spiracles giving them a breathing privilege. Gotta move on, gonna look at the eel. Will it be a true or an electric eel? One of them can shock, that's a really big deal. One can breathe underwater with a nice set of gills. You may not see them because they live in nocturnal. Many different colors, yellow, spotted, blue, and purple. Dive. Deep sea dive. Deep sea dive, gonna take a look at the marine life. Deep sea dive, deep sea dive, 
see how many animals we can find on a deep sea. A deep sea dog, gonna see them all and it's gonna be nice on a deep sea. A deep sea dog, gonna take a look at the marine life. Deep sea dog, deep sea dog, gonna take a look at the marine life. Deep sea dog, deep sea dog, see how many animals we can find on a deep sea. A deep sea dog, gonna see them all and it's gonna be nice on a deep sea. A deep sea dog, gonna take a look at the marine life. Deep sea dog, deep sea dog, gonna take a look at the marine life. Deep sea dog, deep sea dog. Thank you, Roy, for providing that original music for this deep sea science episode. That was absolutely awesome, as usual. Be sure to check out more of Roy's music and other resources for students at the STEM Music. That was a fun break. And if you're just tuning in, we are diving into today's ocean themed episode, Deep Sea Science. I hope you're ready to meet our second and final speaker of the day. Can you imagine a job that brings you face to face with great white sharks? For our next speaker, that's just another day in the office. Chris Fisher is the founding chairman and expedition leader for OSEARCH, a global nonprofit organization conducting unprecedented research on our ocean's giants, including great white sharks. Their global shark tracker app allows you to follow along at home by observing the migrations of sharks and other marine animals that have been tagged by state-of-the-art satellite tracking technology. You might want to grab your scuba gear because we're going on a field trip to the Carolina coast aboard the OSEARCH research vessel. Chris, along with his crew and visiting scientists, are joining us from Expedition Carolinas and the Atlantic Ocean for an up-close look into OSEARCH's research vessel and the diverse STEM jobs involved in their shark tracking expeditions. Let's get ready to head out to the Atlantic Ocean. Chris and team, welcome to XSTEM. Take it away. Hey everybody, greetings from the deck of the O-Search. My name is Chris Fisher and we are off North Carolina right now trying to solve the life history puzzle of the North Atlantic Great White Shark. Where are they mating? Where are they gestating? Where are they giving birth? And what's their full migratory range? These are all questions we're trying to solve and it takes a lot of people to come together to do that. We have scientists from over 20 different institutions that are all studying marine biology, engineers looking after our equipment on the ship, chefs in the kitchen, and captains navigating across the globe. So science, technology, engineering, and math is all around us on the deck of the O-Search. There's a million different ways to feel like you're on expedition with us. You can track the sharks yourselves on the free app or at osearch.org, as well as, did you know you can tweet a shark? So look us up across social platforms and you'll understand and be able to go in depth on all of the various science projects that are going on. And now Robbie will take you into a little more detail. Hi everyone, I'm Robbie Romer and I'm the science program coordinator here at OSEARCH. Together we have 23 different research projects with 42 different scientists. Utilizing these three tags, the spot tag, the PSAT, and the acoustic tag, we can look at these patterns of where sharks are spending most of their time in the ocean, either to pup, or to mate. And once we figure out these patterns, we can write papers that help influence the conservation of these white sharks for years to come. Some of our most exciting projects include taking blood samples to look at the health of sharks, looking at DNA to see what sharks have been eating in a span of weeks to months to years. We take images of the shark's stomach to see if the shark may be pregnant. We also do length and width measurements to see how sharks are changing over time which is called morphology. Also I like to take a little sample of water and we can actually see what animals have been swimming through that water column, whether it be sharks, turtles, other species of fish. And all of this together creates a big picture of how to protect and conserve these very important apex predators. You wouldn't believe the amount of science, technology, engineering, and math that goes into the gear that the fishing crew uses. We have accelerometers measuring the force each animal pulls when we bring it to the lift. And every single connection and device must be strong enough to endure the pressure it will be under. So STEM is all through the fishing crew. Hey, my name is Christian Purcell. I'm part of the fishing crew here at OSEARCH, and uh, we use math and science almost daily when we're out there fishing for white sharks. 
Uh, one way we do that is we have to measure out how deep or how shallow we want our baits in the water. Uh, so we count our feet in fathoms. So a fathom is every six foot. Uh, so if we're setting a bait down at eight fathoms, we'd put the bait down to 48 feet. And we can judge that by usually just one arm length. Uh, it's about six feet long. Another way we use science and math in our daily lives is weather conditions. A lot of times we'll judge the speed of the wind in knots versus miles per hour, as well as the speed of a boat in knots versus miles per hour. And then something like swell height would be in meters as opposed to feet. Even on the fishing side of things, uh, math and science are absolutely crucial in our everyday lives. Uh, it helps us do our best work we can to provide the animals for the scientists and have this whole thing come together. One of the really unique assets we have at OSEARCH is the ship itself. It has a very specialized lift on the deck that allows us to pick 75,000 pounds out of the water with less than one degree of list. So you can imagine the physics behind that. How do we do that? We move tremendous amounts of water, they call ballast in the ocean, from side to side, counterbalancing that weight. So as you can tell, we live in a STEM environment, and if we don't get the math right, nothing goes right. Now to go a little bit more in depth on the lift, Captain Dave Stevenson. I'm Dave Stevenson. I'm a captain and chief engineer in Bordeaux Search. My day-to-day -day does involve quite a bit of mathematics and engineering. Everything from working with the hydraulics to water making to uh, voyage planning. And one of the things that makes us unique is our lift which enables us to uh, pull the shark up to deck height and allow the scientists to take all the samples they need. So if you're interested in engineering and mathematics, one day you could be aboard as possibly one of the crew and working with us to help maintain this beautiful vessel. One of the most important jobs out here when people are working three or four weeks in a row is making sure everyone has enough fuel to be able to get up and have a good day and a productive day on the ship and the most important job in making sure that happens is Chef Felipe. Now you are off to the galley. Hi, my name is Felipe. I'm the chef here at All Search uh, Vessel. Uh, we are here at the moment on my favorite space, which is the galley. Uh, in your house will be called the kitchen. My role here on the ship is basically make sure that everybody is fed and taken care. It's, uh, it's a lot of logistics in the back. Um, we, can, we usually have like 20 people on the boat, uh, plus once we have daily guests, we usually have 30 people for lunch, in average. Uh, so there's a lot of logistics, science, math behind this. Um, I only supply the boat once. I, I can't just keep going back and forward, getting more food. So you have to make sure that you have all the numbers correct. How are you gonna do this? You're actually gonna have to do math and then you're gonna get it done to a, to a dial number. Usually six to eight ounces of protein for each soul it's on the boat. Inclusion is one of the core values at OSEARCH. How can we get everyone included in the work so everyone is included in creating the abundant future? Well, you do that by communicating and by sharing all your information in an open sourced way. Now, you're off to page to see how OSEARCH tries to include the world in this journey. Hey everyone, my name's Paige and my outlet onto the ship was actually through marketing. So I'm OSEARCH's communication specialist, and my main job is to get all of the great work that our science team, our crew, our captains, everything that they're doing, push it out so fans like you know what's going on. OSEARCH has Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube accounts, and on those accounts, we're really pushing the science, our expeditions, all of that to keep everyone at home informed on what we're doing. Really the reason I love my job here at OSEARCH as a communication specialist is that we get to push out the word about our oceans and our sharks. Sharks really have this bad PR problem with movies that people really tend to fear them when actually they're a huge piece of the abundance of the ocean. Sharks are the apex predators that kind of help hold on to that ocean abundance. And it's gonna take all of us getting the word out there pushing the facts over the fear of sharks to make sure that we keep our oceans healthy and clean for years to come. Soon we will be passing that responsibility on to you. Your approach and how you handle that task will determine how much life is on planet Earth. 
So we hope you dig into your STEM skills. Check the emotion at the door when it comes to these issues. Use your science, your engineering, your math, and chase down that data and make a decision that's centrist, that takes care of all stakeholders so we can actually create a practical path toward abundance, pass it off to you guys, and you all maintain that trajectory. A lot of people ask us if there's any sort of fear involved with the work we do, and it's not. I think what most people really need to understand is these sharks behave just like any other fish. It's not like what you've seen in the movies. They just want to do their own thing and they want to get away. And so, no, the biggest fear that we really um, focus on is making sure we understand the weather forecast and the seas that we're getting ready to encounter, because by far our single biggest thing to, to really be aware of is the weather, because the power of the ocean is insurmountable, and you really just need to listen to her, and when she tells you to go inside and wait, you go inside and wait. It's just simply a battle you're not going to win. So no fear with the sharks, but tremendous amount of respect for Mother Ocean and for the weather that surrounds her. Our next question comes from a student in Canada who wants to understand what they should study if they want to have a job like we have out here on the O-Search. Well, the first thing I think to say is that there's many different jobs on the O-Search, right? We have our marine biologists. If you want to study marine biology and get yourself working on the ocean, the one thing I would say you must study alongside of that is communications and some content because we live in this world of connectivity and communications. And if you don't know how to tell people why your science is important and what you will actually be doing to answer a question or solve a problem, it's going to be very difficult to succeed in that space. But you could also be a mechanical engineer and you could be working on the engines and the generators and the systems of the ship. Additionally, there's filmmakers out here that are filming everything and documenting everything, still photographers as well, and that gets pushed then into communications team, which is then pushing that out to the world so they can feel like they're included and they're here with us. So there are many, many different paths onto the ship, whether it's part of the fishing crew and understanding how the ocean works and how to put gear together to handle complex tasks, whether you're a chef and you can cook and keep everyone fueled through that whole trip so we can work for extended periods. A marine biologist of any sort of different discipline, a communicator, a filmmaker, there is a path out here to get in the middle of really what all adds up together as to be a really complex, important STEM puzzle that's shared with the world in real time. This next question comes from a high school student in Oregon. How long is your normal expedition and what's the longest you've stayed out to sea? We typically do about three 21 to 25 day expeditions a year. Some of them can be longer if we're in a really remote place. The longest expedition we ever had was 90 days off of South Africa in 2012. So, you know, we get an average of about 90 to 100 days a year at sea. Most of that is during expedition time. This next question is from a student in Jamaica. What are we studying on our next expedition? Well, we're on that expedition right now and we're off the coast of North Carolina, just south of the Outer Banks in Onslow Bay. And the reason we're here is we're seeing our big mature males and our big mature females move into this part of the coast all at the same time. And we've sampled some of these animals and we've seen the hormones in the blood of the males with a higher level of testosterone and in the females, a higher level of estrogen. So that is indicating to us that they may be mating in this region. So what the fishing crew is really working hard at doing right now is trying to capture these white sharks and we're hoping that the opportunities we get come from big mature males and big mature females so we can really try to drill down and understand if mating is actually occurring right here off the Carolinas each winter in the eastern seaboard of the United States and, and if we are able to do that um, it would be the first time in history a white shark mating site had been discovered and documented and published in the science space. We'd like to give a shout out and thank you to the USA Science and Engineering Festival for hosting the XSTEM All Access Conference. And now back to you guys for more from XSTEM. Wow, that was amazing. Chris and team, thank you so much for welcoming us aboard the MV O-Search. Please join me in giving Chris and the O-Search team a virtual high five and round of applause. 
And for any educators in the audience, you can access free curriculum and programs that integrate Chris Fisher's research projects and technology of the OSEARCH Global Tracker into inquiry-based lessons for students in grades K through 12. Head over to osearch.org education for more. Students can also follow along with Chris's current expedition and download the free Expedition Carolina STEM activity packet at the URL on screen. I hope this program has inspired you to dream big. Keep the momentum going and take the next step by visiting usasciencefestival.org slash next steps for free STEM resources from today's speakers, our partners, and more. Here you'll find a list of free resources to help guide and enhance your own STEM journey. Teachers, you'll find educator materials here too. I'd like to again thank our generous partners at AstraZeneca and the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Department of Defense, DOD STEM, for supporting this XSTEM All Access program. I hope you all have enjoyed today's fourth and final installment of this XSTEM All Access series. It has been an absolute blast meeting our group of STEM mentors, role models, and inspirers. If you miss any of the sessions, the entire series will be available on demand at no cost. Visit usasciencefestival.org for more. Mark your calendars for these upcoming programs from the USA Science and Engineering Festival. Get ready for another XTEM All Access in September. Educators, join us in May and November for the Inspire Educators Workshop Series, hosted by world champion magician and host of Impossible Science at Home, Jason Latimer. And don't miss the SciFest Virtual Expo in October. Visit usasciencefestival.org for more information. And don't forget to show us how you STEM. Tag at USA Science Fest and me at Mr. Fascinate and use the hashtag show us how you STEM and XSTEM. Thank you for joining us from around the globe. Each and every one of us has the ability to change the world. I can't wait to see what that future holds for you, the next generation of innovators. Thank you so much for joining us.